So we're going to look at parametric equations. So you know what equations are. So the question is, what is parametric? So parametric basically means parameters. So usually uh, our <coughs> uh, functions that we're dealing with, they go from not necessarily all real numbers to all real numbers, but some subset of real numbers to some other subset of real numbers. So before our functions generally went So we had from some real numbers to some other real numbers, and our functions look like that. Uh, what we're going to do now, and so these are, are res very restrictive. So for example, let's say you want to model uh, a, how a wheel rotates a position on a wheel. You can certainly draw a circle, but the problem is that's not a function of x. But there's plenty of things that move in a circular motion. Wheels, uh, spears, different things that are circular. Uh, <clears throat> but we can't model this directly with a function. So what we're going to do is uh, look at different types of functions that could model this. Uh, so our functions that we're going to look at in this section, I'll use the letter h. And so before, another way to write this, f colon r to r, that just means the domain and the range are r and r. So our parametric functions are going to go from the real numbers, but instead of just outputting a real number, they're going to output two real numbers, also known as a two-dimensional vector. So our functions are now going to output two dimensions these parametric functions well. The input parameter, now you are used to using x. The problem with using x is when we graph these functions, one of the output axes is going to be x. So what that means is I want to save x for the output. So I'm going to use a different letter. The letter we're going to use is t. And now t is going to go to two functions. Let's call them uh, f of t and g of t. Uh, you could write it as a point, or you could write it as a vector. It doesn't really. Turns out there's no real difference between points and vectors, other than the way you draw them. So there's really two functions hiding inside these parameter, uh, parameterized functions. There's an x function and a y function. So we could write our x function it is really x equals f of t. And we have our y function. Our y equals g of t. And when we graph, When we graph h of t, we generally don't graph the t values. We're going to graph the output x and y values. So if we look at this, this system of two equations, these are called parameter uh, parametric equations. You could call this a uh, h function. You can call this a parametric function. Uh, also known as a vector function. And of course, you can have a function that outputs three into three dimensions. It will look the same. You just have a f of t, g of t, and maybe a other function of t, little h of t. But it would just be a third coordinate in your output if you went to three dimensions. 
Uh, it's really hard to graph those, so we're, we're going to mostly focus on two dimensions and not worry about the three dimension uh, outputs. So we're just going to go ahead and start with a graph and see how that works. And usually, the domain of these functions is going to be not all real numbers, but some closed interval from A to B. Not always true, but generally, uh, the ones I have you graph, I'm going to just put a finite interval from A to B. So our first example will graph <coughs> h of t three t squared and two t those are the outputs and the domain of this particular function is negative two to two all right how do you graph when you're not really sure what this function is going to look like How do we graph our sine cosine functions before we knew hardly anything about them? Clueless method. Source can plot some points. All right. So we're going to pick input values, in this case, t values. So our t's are between negative 2 and 2. So we'll just go negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. So we'll just write those five out. Of course, we see the two equations here. So that means our x. Sometimes it's written as x of t because x is a function of t. If you know what t is, you know what x is. So x of t is 3t squared, and our y of t function is 2t. So clueless method involves creating your table first. This table is going to be a little strange. t is the left column. That's the input. Negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. You could plot other points in between, like uh, 1.5 or 0 0.5, but I think we'll get enough from just these five points. So we'll do our x first, 3t squared, and then we'll do our y, which is 2t. So we're just filling out this table. So square negative 2 is 4 times 3 is 12. Negative 1 squared is 1 times 3 is 3. 0, 3, 12. So those are all the x values right there. I just um, applied the function to the different t values. Now y is even easier to compute. You just double all your t values. So we got negative four times two is uh, negative two times four. Let me just write it. We get negative four is our output when t is negative two. Uh, when t is negative one, our output is negative two. 2 times 0 is 0, 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times 2 is 4. So are there any questions filling out this table? Should be pretty straightforward. All right, now the tricky part, when we graph, you're graphing x, y points like this. So what you don't want to do, and I'll do it in red, don't use t. So you don't want to use t as one of your coordinates. So our first point is going to be 12, negative 4. Our next point, 3, negative 2, 0, 0, 3, positive 2, and 12, 4. So go ahead and graph those five points. And keep track of the order you graph them.
So questions on the graph of the points. So just looking at the graph, could this graph be a function of uh, x? If you picked an x, could you tell me what y is? You can only tell me between two different y values, basically. So this could not be written as a function of x right here. Uh, this does have a familiar shape, however. If you turn your head sideways, what shape is this? Parabola. Parabola. Very good. So this is a parabola opening. It's a happy parabola, but it's happy going down the x-axis, the positive x-axis, not happy going up the y-axis. So it is a parabola. However, this parabola does not go on forever, so do not draw arrows at the end. This parabola does not keep going. There is some, we do draw arrows. The arrows we're going to draw are what we call an orientation. Now, if you have a one-dimensional object, an orientation just tells you which direction to travel on the object. So it's either uh, go this way or go the other way. And this is where you want to keep track of the uh, way that you drew them. This was uh, t equals negative 2, t equals 1, t equals 0, t equals 1, t equals 2. So I'm going to orient increasing t values. So our first point was the, upper, the uppermost point. So the orientation goes kind of downwards. It's hard to say left or right because depending on where you are, it's going left and right. But this is how the orientation looks right here. Uh-oh, did I do this wrong? Oh, yeah, I sure did. So I ori oriented the complete wrong way on this. So I got all my signs wrong. So our positives are at the top. My negatives are at the bottom, which means we orient this way. So think of it like a one-way street. You're just telling which is the way to go. That's all. The reason we use T for parameters is because it a lot of times represents time. So you could think of maybe a car driving along the road might take this path right here at different time values. And then the orientation just shows the direction that that object was moving. All right, the second thing I can ask you, uh, given a parametric equation is I could ask you to convert it to rectangular. So this equation is almost rectangular. What did rectangular equations have before? So they, first of all, they are equations. But when we converted, what did we turn a polar equation into? An equation with what? X and Y. So what I want is one equation with just X and Y, no Ts. So it's my goal to take these two equations right here, turn them into one equation with x and y and no t. So let's go ahead and do that next. So we want one equation. with x and y only, which means no t's. And I'll write down our two equations. We had x equals 3t squared and y equals 2t. How do I get rid of t? So you have two general strategies for solving equations. Most of these are not going to be linear. So this is not linear because t is being squared. How can I get rid of t? So basically, substitution and elimination are the two ways to solve systems. It doesn't matter which one you use. In this case, I think substitution is going to be way easier. So what I'm going to do is solve for t in one equation and plug it into the other. So which equation is easier to solve for t, the x or the y equation? Oh, very good. You can solve for t in x, but you get plus minus square root. So we're going to go ahead and solve for t here. So y over 2 equals t. 
And once you have t, you're going to take this y over 2 and plug it in for t in the other equation. So we're going to eliminate t and replace it with y over 2. So we have x equals 3 times y over 2 squared. And we can square this out. Technically, right now we're done. We have one equation, no t's anymore, just x's and y's. So at this point, this is a converted equation. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and square things. So we have 3, 2 squared is 4, 3 fourths y squared. This is a parabola. It's just a little strange because the square is on the y, not on the x, which is the reason it opens sideways and not up or down. Uh, if you go back to transformations, there is a vertical stretch. It's a little strange because things are written differently, but there is a vertical stretch happening on this parabola. So here is our equation that would be represented on the graph. There is one drawback to converting, and that is you lose what, uh, <clears throat> if you just graph this equation right here, what it would graph as is the parabola going on forever. So you lose the restriction on the uh, domain, basically, and the orientation. So you, that's one of the drawbacks of converting. You don't know which way the car was driving anymore or uh, how long it was driving for. So we're going to do a few more of these problems. So this previous example we graphed and then converted. You don't necessarily have to do it in that order. You could convert and then graph. The only drawback is you'll have to watch out about your domain. You're usually not going to have a full domain. Remember, rectangular also means Cartesian. Find rectangular equation and graph. So this time I'll just write them as parametric equations. And we'll take t in the interval 0 to pi. All right, let's do the other order. Let's get a rectangular equation first and then graph second. All right, how do we convert to a rectangular equation? What did we do last time? So we did a substitution. We solved for t and plugged into the other equation. That almost always works. And it will work in this case. The only problem with it is it can take a long time. So let's go ahead and I'd say they're equally difficult to solve for t, so it doesn't matter which one I pick. I'll just go solve for t in the first equation. So solve for t in one equation. So first step, divide by a. What is the last step to solve for t? How do I get cosine out of there? So we're going to move the function on the other side with the inverse function. So that's how inverse functions work. So we have cos inverse x over a equals t. Now be careful, cos inverse is not the reciprocal of cosine. So this is not, you can't just reciprocate x over a here. All right, so we have cos inverse uh, for t. Now we're going to plug this into the second equation. So we're going to take this version, and where I see t, I'm going to plug that in for t. So it's the same exact procedure. So we're subbing into the other equation. So 
way, y equals a sine, and now t is replaced by cos inverse x over a. So at this point, we have one equation in x and y only, and there's no t's anymore. The only drawback is it's a really ugly equation. Do you remember simplifying things that look just like this? We did simplify things that look just like this, and we're about to do it now. So I'm just going to write the relevant part, sine cos inverse x over a. How did we simplify a trig function of an inverse trig function? So regular trig functions take angles to sides, generally. And inverse trig goes the opposite way and takes sides over to angles. So if we look at the inside function right here, that's an inverse function, which means it's going its output, its output is going to be angles. So what we do here is let theta equal cos inverse x over a. And now move the cosine function to the other side. Cos theta equals x over a. And we're going to use SOHCAHTOA now. So cos theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. So draw your right triangle. Theta hypotenuse is a, adjacent is x. How do I find the third side, the opposite side? We did this probably a month ago. So this may seem a little unfamiliar. How do I get the third side of a right triangle? What's the oldest theorem you know about? Pythagorean theorem. So we got the two squared equals the third side squared. I'm just going to shortcut. Well, maybe I won't shortcut. I'll write it as y. So we get x squared plus y squared equals a squared. So I want to know y squared. So y squared a squared minus x squared square root. Good news is you don't need to worry about plus minus when you're doing these simplifications here. So for the side y, we have square root a squared minus x squared. So coming back up to where we started, all this stuff turned into theta. All the stuff I underlined turned into theta. So we got sine theta, which is opposite over hypotenuse. And now we're looking at the same triangle, opposite side, square root a squared minus x squared over hypotenuse, which is a. So this was way back, probably 10, somewhere in chapter 10. I want to say the inverse trig function chapter is where this comes from. So you may need to go back and review that. Uh, you can do this with just algebra and not uh, triangles, but I want to go through that right now. You can look back in the notes and see the algebraic way to do this. So we're going to take what we just simplified, which I'll underline. Everything we simplified was basically everything except the times a. So I'm going to replace all that stuff I underlined with that right there. So we have y equals a times this thing right here. All right. Now that we're out of trig land, Let's see how well we can simplify this down. So what are some 
What's an easy simplification to make here? What can I do with those two A's? So I can't cancel the A's. So fractions generally suck. We got out of fractions. Square roots are not terribly fun either. How can I get the square root out of there? Square, square both sides. So that gives us y squared equals a squared minus x squared. And the last thing I'm going to do is add x squared to the other side. All right, that's pretty simple. x squared plus y squared equals a squared. Rectangular equation, it's got x and y only, no t's anymore, and just a single equation. I did have a rectangular equation way at the top of the board, but that was really ugly. So I like this one way better. What is the graph of this equation? If I write in general form, what's the graph of this equation? Circle. Where's the center? Origin, zero, zero. What's the radius? A. So this is a circle, radius A, centered it right at the middle at the origin. All right, if I graph it, easy to graph. It's going to look something like that, A minus A, A minus A. All right, <clears throat> I did lose some information, though. There's supposed to be an orientation on this circle, so we should be spinning one of the two ways. And there is a restriction on up here on the t values. So here's what the rectangular equation graphs like. Let's go ahead and graph the original parametric and see what that looks like. So we're going to do the clueless method on uh, these equations. So we add x, a cos t, Y is a sine t, and t is in the interval 0 to pi. So we make our table of values. Now in this, we know what the, uh, what the graph's going to basically look like. It's going to look circular. So I don't need to graph every angle that I know about between 0 and pi. I'm just going to graph a few of them. So let's do 0, pi over 2, and pi. We'll just do 3 t values there. I could do pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 2. There's quite a few angles I know about in between those right there. But I have a good idea what the graph's going to look like, so I'm not graphing so many points. All right, so cosine 0 is 1. So this is a. Cos pi over 2 is 0 cos pi is negative a, or negative 1 times a is negative a. Now sine starts at 0, sine pi over 2 is 1, which gives us a, and sine pi again is 0. So writing out the points, we have a0, 0, 0, a, negative a, 0. So how far over is a? I'm not sure. I'll just say it's that far. You can decide how big you want to draw A. Looks like I picked 4 on this right here. So don't draw what I'm going to draw in red. This is not what the graph looks like. So if I plotted more points, I would clearly you see there's no point right here. The point's actually up there if I went and plotted these points. So this is not really the clueless method because I have a good idea of what the graph looks like right above. So our curve is going to be a circle or a half circle in this case. And 
And I also have to pick an orientation. Now, I'm not, it's not really a choice. It's based on the order that the points were graphed. So we had the A0 point first, the right point, and then the top point, and then the left point. So it goes in the standard rotation our angles go in. This particular one goes that direction. So any questions about our parametric graph here? So again, I could have graphed first, but I would have had to do a little more work with my angles just to be sure that I got the correct graph. All right, there is a way faster way to convert this to a rectangular equation. Way, way, way faster. So what I showed you before uh, will work pretty much all the time. The only problem is it can take a very long time to get there. What identity do you know that uses a cosine and a sine and somehow gets rid of those? What identity has a cosine and a sine in it? Yep, so we have that original Pythagorean identity. Cos squared plus sine squared equals 1. So let's think about that. We know that cos squared t plus sine squared t equals 1. What I want to do, and of course this uh, notation is really bad for exponents, so I'll write it with the slightly better exponential notation. Alright, what I want to do on the next line is have a cos t and a sine t. What algebraic operation would it take to go from the second to the last equation to the last? So what operation what would I have to multiply by to go from the black equation to the blue one? So it looks like I should be multiplying by A. But if you look carefully, there's really a squared cos squared. When you want to put the A inside the square, you have to have A squared in order to do that. So what I'm really multiplying by is A squared, right there. So 1 times A squared is A squared. And now what we can do from here, I'm going to factor the so we're going to factor the a squared out. Wait, is that what I want to do? It's absolutely not what I want to do. No, it's a bad idea. All right, this a cos t is x, and the a sine t is y. There we go. So there's our rectangular equation. So if you remember some Pythagorean identities or other identities, there might be a way faster way to convert your equation than go the scenic route, which is what we did the previous version. Uh, the other way to think about this is the same exact procedure, just a slightly different perspective. Just looking at these two, if I square them and add them together, I'll be able to use that identity. So if I start out with a cos t squared, a sine t squared, this is x squared plus y squared. And <clears throat> all I did was just write, I got x squared and I got y squared, so I just wrote it x squared plus y squared, and now factor out. So it's a squared cos squared t 
plus a squared sine squared t factor out the a squared. So we got cos squared plus sine squared. And then cos squared plus sine squared is 1. So this is just a squared equals. And the right side is x squared plus y squared. So here's pretty much the same procedure, just slightly different perspective, getting to the same place. So now we're going to look at an inverse type of problem. So I'm going to give you a rectangular equation and then ask you what parametric equation could represent the same thing. So given y equals x squared minus 4, write a parametric function with the same graph. So in this case we started with rectangular, I want to end up with parametric. So if we look at our equation, if you know y, is it easy to figure out what x is? Not too easy, and you'll get a plus minus. If you know what x is, is it easy to figure out what y is? Square it, subtract 4, you got y. So if you know x, it's easy to see what y is. So I'll write that down. If we know x, it's easy to find y. You have it right here, x squared minus 4. All right, so I'm going to let x equal t. So if you know what x is, x is t, our y is x squared minus 4, which is just now t squared minus 4. So there's our parametric equations. We've got x equals t, and y equals t squared minus 4. And if we write it as a function, it's really similar. Just to have your x of t, y of t function t comma t squared minus 4. So if you already have a function of x, this is how you can go about it very easily. Just let x equal t. If you already have a function of y, you do the same thing. Just let y equal t. And then x will be that function of y. So we'll do the same problem, except this time you won't be able to solve for x and y. All right, so if you try to solve for x or y, you'll get plus minus square root. So we can't really use that trick we did last time. So let's think about this. Let's do a little algebra first. So y squared over 9 is y squared over 3 squared. And now I'm going to factor the power out. This looks a lot like the identity we just saw. Co squared plus sine squared equals 1. So what should be cos? So I can let x equal cos. Now in this case, it's going to be cos t. Now, <clears throat> y is a little more tricky. y over 3 needs to be sine. And that's a little tricky. What this lets me do, this is cos squared t plus 
sine squared t equals 1 if I substitute them in. And the only thing we have to do at the end is we have x equals cos t, y equals 3 sine t. So there's our parametric equations. And if I want to write it as a function, I think the original problem said to write as a parametric function. H is always just going to be x of t, y of t. So we have cos t 3 sine t. And generally when you convert, you'll, you won't know the restriction on t. There probably won't be a restriction on t. So in this case, you can just take t to be all real numbers. And same thing in the previous example, t would be all real numbers up here. So any questions on the, these problems we did? So I opened up this homework section. So a good day for your quiz would be Thursday for parametric. Or uh, cross products could be tomorrow for cross products. Did I put dot products on your midterm? No. no? All right, so dot products and cross products could be tomorrow.